Hello, everyone. Hello, how are you? Pretty good. On that side, a bit more quiet. <laughs> Still happy? <laughs> the, mo the moody side? Uh, the moon side and the sun side. Ah, let's test that out tonight. The sun, indeed, our source of life. What relationship do we have with her, our sun? Welcome to the second part in a four-part series, uh, part of the Solar Biennale around the sun and our relationship with her. And this time we're going to tackle the social, the societal aspect of this uh, conversation. Also, welcome to those of you watching this later on online. Um, very happy uh, that you're catching up with us. The first hour you will be able to experience the conversation. And after that, we'll have half an hour on offline here together to uh, discuss things off the record. Um, this is, of course, a collaboration between Pocas Zweiger, which welcomes you very warmly, and the Solar Biennale. And I'll be here tonight uh, with an three really interesting speakers. I'm going to introduce you to them as they, uh, as they come. And I welcome you all, of course, as well, to be part of this conversation. So just like sun side, moon side, make sure to catch my attention and I'll include your question uh, uh, in the discussion as well. All right? All right. All right? <laughs> moon people. <laughs> yes. OK, we're here. <laughs> Great, so the first speaker I have the honor of introducing to you all is Pallas Achterberg. And Pallas has worked on strategic and innovation challenges in this energy transition for the last two decades already. Um, I know her as a very intelligent, very knowledgeable, very strategic thinker indeed. Uh, she's currently the challenge officer at Aliander, which some of you may know. Uh, and among many other board positions, she's also founding board member of the Solar Biennale itself. So please warmly welcome her, Paulus Achterberg. <laughs> Can't wait to hear your presentation, Paulus. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, well, maybe I'll start at the dark side of the moon. Mm. And that's us. We are the dark side of the moon. In fact, ever since we invented uh, to use the power of fire, we started burning and burning like pyromaniacs. We burn everything until nothing's left of this <coughs> planet. If we, we burn for heating, we burn for electricity. We burn when driving a car, the combustion engine. We burn all day through. You don't even know that you're burning things. Pyromaniac. <laughs> so how, how to change that? Um, and I ask you to, to think you are a virus. Suppose you are a coronavirus. And look at this from this perspective. We are here in the last 100,000 years or so, sometimes they say a million years, but if you take a million years and you take that of the to to total time-lapse of uh, planet Earth uh, and you put that time-lapse in 24 hours, we've been here a minute. And in this minute, things go terribly wrong. So in terms of a virus, uh, we are killing our host, which is not a good idea for a virus because you die yourself. So let's become an intelligent virus and uh, change ourselves into a way that, uh, that we can actually keep on living here. So we need to come out of the dark side of the moon. And in this presentation, I will uh, ask three philosophers how they look on, upon this, this question, how to transform ourselves into not killing our host. Um, and the first one is uh, a social philosopher, Habermas, and he's talking about system uh, world and life world. He developed the theory of communicative action. Oh, um, I never do this, so yeah, yeah a different one. Um, and he says, well, how we think is how we talk, 
how we talk is how we think. And, uh, and the way we talk in private or with people you know close, you talk different than the way you talk in more business-like environments. Um, and you could say there's this uh, way how you talk with your friends and with your family is uh, more like the old ways, the, the, the worlds of tradition where it is about community and, and talking is in a sense that it comes to uh, consensus. It's consensus-oriented. Uh, and what is important is honesty and truth and sincerity. But more and more what we're doing is uh, different. It's like uh, steering media from the systemic world uh, in terms of money and power, in terms of reward and punishment. It's about efficiency and goals. Um, Habermas describes back in the 70s how this system world slightly step by step takes over this way of communicating in the live world, which means that, uh, that we, we talk much more in terms of efficiency, uh, in terms of returns on investment, if you talk to solar about solar panels, but also in rewards or even in punishment. And if you look at it from that perspective, a lot of the policies in the Dutch government are just like that. So we, we all start to think like systems, uh, which is it's, it's quite a, a, a difficult thing. And uh, it's so even this week, we, we have a solar team, which is very a community. And we, we really look how to work together. And we had this supplier. He suddenly, well, they started to talk in terms of money and power. And it was quite confusing how to connect with these different types of worlds. So it was happening with our team this week. It's there. It's there all the time. Um, and, uh, well, the idea that Habermas gives us to live in a happy world, um, we, you need to be part of this community. And in this system world, if you start living there, life's becoming shallow and dark, like the dark side of the moon. And uh, you become alienated. And this is uh, what, what we see here, this uh, uh, Magritte uh, uh, picture describes it, how we start acting towards each other in a, in a lineated uh, world. And uh, he said the, the moment that you're losing it all is when dreams are produced by the system through advertisement or things like that. We're pretty close to that moment. So this was the social philosopher. Always good to look at Habermas. Now I have an ecologic philosopher, Bruno Latour. Um, yeah, Bruno Latour says things went wrong when we when we listened to uh, Descartes, um, where Descartes in Amsterdam, not far from here. Uh, the, oh yeah, next. Uh, oh, that was too much. Well, Leave the presentation. I just do it like this. Um, Descartes divided the soul and the ratio. We have a soul as, pe as, as humans, uh, uh, and we have a ratio, but these are different things. And we have a body, which is like a machine. And by doing that, by putting the soul different from the machine, he said that well, the soul is divine uh, and nature is just part of the things we can control. It's like a machine. Nature is a machine. And of course, before that in Christianity, nature was seen as given us to us by God just to take what you want. Um, but uh, Bruno Latour thought this, this, this div division from the soul and rage was very important. 
Um, and since then, not in his terms, but in my terms, we started to act like this virus. Um, and, uh, well, if we look at it now, we can say, okay, things are getting pretty wrong. So we need a new, that's what he says, we need a new type of governance, a transformative governance. And uh, the way we, ha we have governance is like the government and politics. And the way we use politics right now, uh, we should do politics ri right now, is to uh, evaluate the different perspectives from not only the humans, but also from the trees or the sea, we should look at perspectives not just from uh, the human uh, part of it. And he says the science, what we use right now, is we act as if we know, but we don't. Science is always just a step further than we did before, but it's never the conclusion. So if you understand that you don't understand everything, and if you can see that your interest and your perspective is not the whole perspective, then something new can start. And then we can make steps further. And these steps further is like uh, experimenting in making the next step. And he says, the parliament, the way we, we are organize ourselves in politics, should bring together these perspectives. Uh, a parliament, including the parliament of things, as it is called. Um, it's not happening right now. What we, what we see is that politi politicians decide without understanding. Um, so they just ask the, the scientists, and they, they give a report. So nobody knows actually where to influence and how to do this. So here also, people feel alienated from the way decisions are made um, in a technocratic society. Um, so we need a new parliament uh, in all kinds of ways, and uh, ecology needs to be part of this parliament. So this was the ecologist, and now I go to the social economist, um, Bas van Bavel. The Invisible Hand is a book he wrote about five years ago. And um, he developed a theory on the free market economy. As we know, this is, it's also about how we do our economy. And he says, well, we have there are all kinds of different economies, but the free market economy is the one where the factor markets, as he calls them, which is land, uh, labor, and uh, money, these, these are factors, it's not the real thing, it's something you need to have the real thing. Um, if they become a free market, then you get a, a free market economy. And the pattern is that uh, first uh, people can, well, um, now it's a pattern, I need to I need to say, it's a pattern that he has uh, researched in Iran in the 8th century, in Italy in the 13th century, and later in Amsterdam in the 7th century, and then it's in the same way, now it's used in the UK and the US, um, and, and in fact in the whole West. He says, but first the labor market comes, and which is in the 8th century, you can imagine, there's no labor market if you're enslaved or something like that, you cannot hire someone, you can buy someone, it's a different thing. So if you start having a real open labor market, then something changes. If you can buy or sell land, that's the second step. Something changes, and these changes make it that prosperity grows, very much so. And um, uh, then you add capital markets, and then something starts to happen. First, it's, uh, uh, first it goes good, because there will be more money, and more things will be sold and, and bought. And, um, um, but then something happens in terms of everything becomes money. Like, for instance, I saw uh, a picture on a house. Uh, how, uh, houses are for living, not for selling, yesterday here in the streets. And in fact, 50 years ago or even less, you didn't talk about your house in terms of 
what the price was that you bought it for and when you're going to sell it or anything like that. It's already in our minds that we see houses as investment objects instead of places to live. And, um, uh, and this is, if you talk like that, you think like that, then, then the shallow world uh, is uh, getting there. And it's uh, about new things that will be monetized. This, for instance, not the, the supermarket where you go to, but e even the steps towards the supermarket. I get here, new products, monetizing just to go to the supermarket. So things are changing. And I need to speed up, which is quite difficult to finish right now. But I will make a, uh, I'll make it a little bit short term. Um, so he describes it, and, and every time it goes wrong in the same way. And in the English version of his book, he says, well, I don't know any solution. Once you have had it, you will be, in the end, like in the seventh century, after the seventh century, Amsterdam and the Netherlands were very, very poor. Everything was well, sold out, except for a few families that had all the money. And the same thing had happened in Italy before, and the same thing had happened in Iran before. And in a way, it's still happening right now. And he said, I don't know any solution. And then later, in the Dutch version, he said, well, maybe there is a solution. And it is about cooperatives. If you look at the Netherlands, in the uh, end of the 19th century, cooperatives came on. And uh, for for banking, for insurance, for housing, and these cooperatives, very large cooperatives like the social housing we have now, are still a product of that, uh, were a solution to get out of this issue. And uh, in a way, we are now in a new uh, moment in time where cooperatives come up, and uh, where we can build social uh, innovations with the use of energy. And a combination of energy and cooperatives could be a perfect start in order to well, get out of this dark side of the moon and get to a sunny future. So this is where we are. And I think later today we will hear more about the examples of these local solutions with local um, local. Um, uh, participation of the people living there, and uh, it's not a final solution. That's what we learned. It's a step-by-step -step solution, where we not look only at the money side, but look at the total perspective, including the, the ecology of the planet that we live in. Thank you. Thank you, Paulus. Please join me over here, you will be my sidekick for the rest of the evening, luckily. Um, let's take a few minutes to just reflect and discuss before we get our next speaker in. First of all, because maybe not everybody watching and or here knows what the Solar Biennale is, can mm -hmm. you super briefly explain what the Solar Biennale, the solar movement, what they are? Yes, well, we, we started with this idea of um, getting out of the narrative of the, the cheap solar panels um, and um, the, uh, the large solar fields, which for everybody feels a little bit strange. Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. And why are we just looking from this one perspective? And uh, said, okay, this is a good question, but how can we um, invite others to participate? And um, then... Uh, Suddenly, there was this idea of a solar biennale, which seemed, I, I think it was two years ago, which seems like, okay, this is, this is a way of um, getting further. And then, then it worked very, after a few weeks, we had this, this basic question, what is actually, that, what's the alternative? And uh, the alternative is where are we heading to? And we are heading to a fossil fuel, fossil, fossil free society, but how does it look? Yeah. How does that look in terms of social? Mm -hmm. How does that look in terms of well, your personal life? Do we start living with the seasons? Mm -hmm. Are we and I, this stopping to live with the seasons and to stop with the, the, with the, uh, the rhythm of the day yeah. has 
started when we had so much energy that it didn't matter anymore. Mm. And this fossil uh, energy well, created a, a, a change in society. And I just described the social impacts of that change in society today. Yeah, But it's yeah, much more than that. Yeah, exactly, because we see it here as well, the, the four different aspects at the Solar BNN yeah. in these talks are organized around. So we spoke about the personal last time. Tonight's about the social, yeah. we have the spatial, the environmental. But can we maybe try to grasp for a second like, what do we mean by the social aspect if you would just like make it super you know like this is what we what we mean well the in fact the question is how to transform as a virus <laughs> how to <laughs> transform as a, a as virus, a virus to something that not, does not kill its own host yeah let's, let's uh, keep ourselves and the planet alive and uh, if we do that we need to change things and it, it's not just a new technology yeah. it's not just putting the solar on the roof instead in the fields it is, it is much more than it's that. It's a real social transformation. And it yeah. is also a social transformation. It yeah. is also that, well, maybe you could, can come to a CO2-free society, but then it's the question, well, if you work hard on a future, is it the future you want to live in? Mm -hmm. So that's the question you need to ask if you put all the energy in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and maybe to also ground the discussion in a way more because you work in 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 the field you know in the energy field uh trying to create this transition right it's yep. away from fossil towards whatever it is that we envision around clean energy um what would you say in your work do you encounter as big social challenges in getting there what are the social barriers that we've created um well, there, it is uh, for in my work. I look at build environment, like the way we live mm -hmm. uh, in the industry, in mobility. Um, these are the the major elements, and of course the electricity system itself. And we can talk about the, the generation of energy, like solar or wind, and solution when there's no sun and no wind, but it more. Every time, if, if you look at that, it starts with where you use the energy. So instead of creating the energy on one place and using it on the other, which was logical for burning things, mm -hmm. but if you can create it anywhere, why should you do it in a different way? And, and it's very expensive to do it that way, and it's um, it's not necessary to do it that way. So you can integrate that. But to integrate that, for instance, if you can look at build environment, it's the way we live. And when we talk talk about building new houses, for me it feels like one million new houses feels like a plofkip. It feels like uh, the, the standardized econo economical rollout of houses as much as possible, no matter what. Yeah. And um, you should create living spaces where people really feel happy and that can be included with energy. Yeah. So you create the energy which you use in this area as much That's as really possible. That's really interesting to me because your employer, Aliander, there the model is to bring energy from one place yeah, to so the next. Right. That's yeah. how. <laughs> that's but how Aliander makes money. But it's not not mission. The mission is right. to make sure that everybody has energy and that everybody. Yeah. Can rely it means on it. means a big shift, though. Uh, no, and that everybody can pay it. And for this last part, it's mm. also important not to do things that are expensive and unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. Always has been like that. And by the way, if you just do it in, in this old-fashioned way, you need four times more network, which cannot be built in the time that we need. So we need to come up with different solutions also from the infrastructure perspective. Yeah. Let's get our our next speaker in so that we can continue the conversation uh, with the three of us. Uh, unless there are some burning questions right now for Paulus. Burning Sun questions. Sun people? Nobody, nobody dares to burn Moon any people? questions anymore. Nobody? Okay. I'm going to introduce Mella Smith to you. Um, Mella is an artist, a researcher, a curator who has directed several different creative collectives across Europe and South America, in Africa. 
um, to really understand and design public space, if I understand it right, uh, and, and link it to local customs and human behavior. Um, and really looking at kind of the basics of what does it take to design a well-functioning society. Uh, and Mele is here to present his thoughts to us. So let's warmly welcome him as well. Well, I have eight minutes. Yes, you and do. And I'm going to try to glue everything Paulus just told us. Uh, because uh, well, it's great to, to hear you, because there's a lot of things that uh, you said we are trying to bring into practice. And I must say, uh, it doesn't go fast, these, these transitions, and it's, uh, it's hard work. Um, but I will try in eight minutes to somehow give you one example of the projects we are trying to do in order to uh, yeah, maybe show uh, where we stumble upon. Um, well, my name is Melis Metz, indeed. Uh, I think in 2017 already, I started the Human Power Plant. And the Human Power Plant, um, this was one of the first collages we made. It's not on the beamer, sorry, but uh, um, I thought I'd just show it to you. This is on the campus side of Utrecht. Uh, Utrecht uh, has a, a great campus. It's called the Uithof. It has a, a very bad name among the Dutch, but uh, it wanted to become... Uh, the, the hotspot for the brightest minds in the world. Uh, and uh, they asked me to uh, redesign the public space in order to, well, basically um, uh, seduce all these new young bright minds to see uh, the, the, the hotspot of the future. Uh, so I did this together with uh, Cynthia Hathaway and uh, Carlijn Diesveld. We set up the Department of Search with the idea you, you take out the research and you make it only to search, to ask the real big questions and then see what uh, people come up with. Well, one of the issues they had was the, the energy uh, transition and they had uh, this nice brochure with blue skies, with some sun panels in the back and everybody was happy and it was presented that this campus would become uh, the most sustainable campus of, uh, of the Netherlands. Doing some research, we figured out that it's actually one of the most energy-consuming campuses of the Netherlands. And uh, it, in, in, even when you would fill the space or hold Utrecht with uh, solar panels, then it would not be enough. Uh, so we thought that there's something going on. And there we, we thought maybe the perception of energy is so lost, in a way, uh, uh, with, with us, that uh, we thought maybe we should find a way that it becomes more tangible again. And that's how we started the uh, Human Power Plant. Well, I don't do this alone. I work together with uh, Christa Decker, who is uh, the editor of Low Tech Magazine. And they are now doing for 15 years research on how high-tech problems could actually also be solved with low-tech solutions. So they they uh, break open basically uh, the uh, whole tradition of a lot of yeah, good ideas which are not so uh, time or energy consuming as high tech is, uh, but we tend to not believe that they could actually be a solution, so they promote that. So combining me and Chris together, we, we build scenarios of how could we uh, uh, transform uh, uh, um, um, uh, a place, uh, because we always take a, a specific place, uh, into a human-powered uh, society. And, and what will happen if you would actually do that, uh, if, if the human becomes the energy source? Um, so, and that is a sort of scenario making, but at the same time, we do it for real. And I'm going to show you scenario three, because we, we already built three. Uh, where we basically landed in Rotterdam, uh, uh, and the neighborhood is called uh, Bospolder Tussendijken, which is, uh, was uh, uh, formerly built as um, um, the place for dock workers. I don't know if that's an English word, dock workers. It is, yeah. Uh, for people, basically human, human uh, labor for the, for the, for the harbors. Uh, and uh, today, it's actually a very mixed uh, 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 community from people from all over the world. It's a very dense area. I think there are like 7,000 households and there are more or less 14,000 people living there. Uh, so it's, it's quite crowded. And within that, we set up the house of the future. In Dutch, the house, uh, the house of the toekomst. And um, uh, we set up this shop uh, with the idea that uh, if you want to organize an energy transition and you want to make it human powered, you should first make a gathering space where people could actually meet eh, to, to, to talk about this. 
So this is, we started like, I think two years ago. And um, um, to kickstart that conversation, we thought, well, you know, you can uh, organize seminars, you can do a lot of intellectual stuff or have uh, uh, shiny folders. But we thought, no, let's just build, a, build an oven uh, in the in the center of our garden, which was a trash hole, you know, there was there were uh, uh, mice, there were a lot of people were throwing garbage off the balconies, so it was it was not a place to be. But we set up this oven, and there we started to bake bread. And in no time, a lot of uh, people came out. Well, first uh, complaining about the smoke, and then s secondly about oh, but you think you can bake bread? I can do better. And that became like, a, um, yeah, like a, uh, it, it basically just happened uh, under our eyes. And every Wednesday, people come together, they bring their own dough, and that's where they bake bread and, uh, well, be proud about how they bake it. Uh, but with that, we can also start uh, the discussion about our, our yeah, uh, the, the energy transition which is for this community uh, a very apparent uh, change which is uh, happening because uh, Botu, that's like the small word for the community, uh, is one of the first neighborhoods in the Netherlands where they're going to do an energy transition by building a, a, a heat net. Uh, so they are basically burning a lot of garbage in the harbor of uh, Rotterdam, and then they want to use that energy or the heat uh, in this uh, neighborhood to... Um, do I have to speed up? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so they're going to build a huge and a high-tech system in order to, uh, to give this community a new, uh, a new energy source, but it's actually burning a lot of garbage. And at the same time, uh, Mitsubishi, which is a Japanese company, is, is the owner of this, uh, this uh, network. So 7% uh, of all the, the, the revenues go to, go to J Japan directly. And at the same time, uh, this community is, is economically not very uh, uh, rich. Uh, so you could really argue that that, that is not uh, an energy transition if you talk about uh, a, a human power plant. Well, so then we did the math, but I should really speed up, of uh, if you, for example, uh, use solar uh, power, so if you would uh, give this whole neighborhood a solar-powered solar, solar -powered energy, and you look at the, the, the energy they're using now today on, on a daily basis, then basically the whole neighborhood would disappear under, under this solar panel uh, platform. Uh, so you would have light in your house, but not uh, on your head anymore. So you could argue that that will not be the, the, uh, the solution. Um, here we explain a bit how, how we build up the math, but I will now go over that. So if you look at the human, then and you talk about the energy source of the human, then mostly we, we talk about muscles. Eh? Oh, so how, many, how much electricity can you, can you, uh, ca can you source? But uh, if you uh, uh, look more in a holistic way, then uh, the human has, m well, we, we encountered now like, like 11 sources of energy. Eh? We can reproduce ourselves, we are mobile, we can work together. Uh, we are efficient, or, or you could say lazy, uh, because you know if you have to uh, create your own energy, then you would think twice to uh, to do it. Uh, we produce heat. Uh, we can store a lot of energy in our well fat, uh, but also in our belly. So it's it's in that way a very efficient system. And if you look at this neighborhood, then it's even more uh, astonishing if you look at uh, the, the history, but also the behavior of people there now. Uh, they are uh, more or less like a third, uh, they're using a third less energy than the average household in, an, in the Netherlands. So you could say that this neighborhood is a guidance for the rest of the Netherlands. Yeah? We can learn from the people here. While the framing of this neighborhood is the other way around, they are a, a, a problem issue. You know, they're a problem neighborhood. There's a lot of uh, criminality. Uh, the the people are poor, but actually they are having a, a lot of nice ways to uh, well to, to be uh, um, self-sufficient and to also be um, um, uh, flexible. Well, I'm not going over this. Um, maybe I should not tell all of this, but what we found out basically is that this neighborhood was built in pre-oil times. Uh, it, wa it was in the, in the well, just after the, the First World War. So oil was there, but it was not in the perception that we cannot live without it. So this whole neighborhood was basically built on human power, but also with the idea that people always had to walk everything, eh? and you have to basically use the body in order to live. So. 
if you analyze it, then this neighborhood has the foundation to become the most sustainable uh, neighborhood of the Netherlands because, uh, this, let's say, the system is in there. You just have to see it. And with that, we created a scenario where we basically use a lot of knowledge from uh, the cultures of people from, from this neighborhood. Uh, the, the bread baking is one example, how to bake a bread and then everybody tells you how to do it. We basically also do it with the household. Eh? How can you make your household efficient? And then the first thing people told us, well, throw out the, the, the bathroom and the kitchen and we have an extra room uh, in the house. And at the same time, if you do it collectively, it can be much more efficient, it can be more social. And um, well, and in that way, we started to sort of transform those ideas into uh, 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 yeah, uh, more scaled up ideas of, okay, how can we make this this uh, poor social housing because it's now old? It, it should uh, have a it should be refurbished. How can we sort of make ideas how to make that robust again? And then obviously with low tech ideas. And here you see an example of how it was designed in the 20s. Uh, and of course, you can build machines. This is like a big house, uh, a big uh, a, a, a gravity battery, uh, which you could build. It, 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 it's a giant, but it doesn't give much energy, but it's enough to uh, have the light bulbs on. And then maybe there's time for one more. Because what, is, what we found out is if you have like, uh, if you only uh, get it from the human, we will not survive. That's, that's, that's quite uh, uh, sure. Uh, so we need an ally in a way to, to survive, but also to have, uh, to have a, a, a healthy life. And if you then look at our oldest ally we had, the fire, eh, we like to burn things, uh, then I think the, most, the, the biggest problem there is is that it actually is criminalized. Eh? It's forbidden to burn your own fires. Eh? You can hardly, well, you can barbecue, but only uh, in summer times. Um, but uh, the, the fire is basically institutionalized, and it's now, yeah, you, you, you pay by the, um, the energy um, um, uh, company and they burn the fire for you. But if you look at how we use the fire, then it's actually, uh, just as the human body, it's a very uh, uh, a rich uh, uh, source. Um, so what we propose then is to build three big fires for the neighborhood, uh, where, uh, we, which are communal fires, and which are also uh, run by the commons. Uh, so it's, it's, it's based on commoning. And then you could have like a very efficient way of uh, working together, living together, uh, cooking together. Uh, and at the same time, um, 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 you, you can do an energy transition because you reduce energy a lot. And then if you look at history, then the funny thing is we already did it. Yeah, so in the, in the war, uh, they uh, built this huge kitchen, or it's not even that huge, which could provide 4,000 meals a day uh, but that innovation only started when uh, the war broke out. And before that, it was all seen as well. As a, as a housewoman, you know, you should cook your own meals and otherwise, uh, you know, you're lazy and, uh, um, yeah, you should, uh, you, should, you should stay at home. Well, um, so this goes on and on and on. <laughs> but we have, like, a, a, a whole story. And the idea now is that uh, we will stay during this energy transition in Rotterdam uh, during the, the high-tech system is built. And at the same time, we are implementing small uh, communal ideas which are making it very yeah, uh, practical in a way. But it also gives people tools in order to really reduce their own energy consumption because you're basically not using any uh, electricity or, uh, or heating. Then I stop here. Thank you, Mela. Please join us. This was interesting. You're definitely fired up about it yourself. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> um, one question to you, because I feel it's really important, also what you're saying between the lines about, you know, the Solar Biennale is also about kind of exploring the future and, and the beauty of it and, you know, the possibilities and the... Um, but what do you feel we should really not forget about the social side of it, the community side of it, in order to make it work? What should we not forget? Well, I think the most important thing, and that's actually what we are now trying to do here in a very small scale, is that 
if you don't create a common space or a common, well, let's say a public space, but a real one where you can have a, a, a real encounter uh, to, to include everybody into this huge transition, uh, which will be n not only for the elite or only for the poor, it's, it's, you know, it's all our concern. Yeah. And that public space doesn't exist right now, uh, uh, or not really. Uh, and uh, without that, you will, you will basically create a division, and then, then you will have the haves and the not-haves yeah. uh, who will stand you know, not together, but so, Such as the, the 4,000 meal kitchens and the maybe metaphorical fires in the neighborhood? Yeah, so, and mean? if you don't uh, step up or organize this or give this uh, a format, then it will basically not happen because the powers that be you know, will not do it because yeah. for them uh, it's not their, their, their uh, concern. Yeah. Or maybe a concern, but not their agenda, let's yeah. say. And then the time that we have, because I was not eight minutes, <laughs> 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 a bit shorter for this discussion, two things that I really want to uh, explore with the both of you, what I found really interesting. First of all is um, uh, you were saying, Mela, with this image of you know this, this neighborhood covered in in solar panels, it's not possible to power a neighborhood uh, with solar. Well, Paulus was saying like, hey, let's rethink because we can. How? What is what's happening here? Well, I think you already gave the answer, but it's not only the the solar panel. Eh? That's right. what people, uh, and it's the same as with it's not only muscle power. If you talk about humans, right? And I think that a holistic approach. Uh, uh, yeah, has to be somehow also embraced eh? because the issue is that it's not. Right. So if you, for example, uh, we now have a knitting club, so they are basically taking old sweaters and they make wool out of it again. If you call it labor, then suddenly you know that we have to pay tax and we have to you know give these people money and then you need a foundation and then you know you, you get trapped in this system of. Um, um, uh, the economy. So to stay away from it is basically illegal, uh, and that's somehow. Yeah, but, uh, sir, but I, I yeah, feel different solutions. First, about this energy equation, um, the way we look at electricity right now is this is where the energy comes from, and people don't even know that the most energy they use is the gas for heating, and they also use energy in in terms of uh, gas in the car. So, um, and in the future, it might all be electricity. And um, uh, so, it's, I I if you do that all, it's not possible with the solar panels or different types of solar. You need to change things. And so, this, well, pre-Second World War houses, they, uh, they have a really insulation issue. So, this is, mm -hmm. this is uh, from a technical perspective. Um, uh, something you need to solve. So probably it's not possible to produce in a city like that all the energy in the city uh, neighborhood, all the energy that you use. It's, I don't think that's possible. Um, but it's a good idea to start like that. And um, what I also said, in uh, the, the step we need to make is from the system thinking to more the life world where we come from, and that's what you're doing in your projects. So you combine this, well, you, f you feel like the, the value of energy if you need to produce it yourself, whether it's by climbing a tower or uh, by uh, putting on your, sol your own solar panels. But um, it's, it's also about how to change the perspective in terms of this is an area where we live. We live here together. And yeah. if we live here together, what can we do to make it a, a good neighborhood? Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you look at it from that perspective, energy can be very helpful in making that steps. Mm -hmm. yeah. And solar can be a very important part of it, but also uh, oh, insulation actions or uh, well, joint cooking might be something. Yes. Yeah. And uh, why not? And uh, but this, this is not the same for every neighborhood, but certainly in a diverse neighborhood, as you describe here, yeah, baking bread is a perfect start. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a beautiful and, uh, symbol. Yeah. The, uh, I'll, gi I'll give you the, uh, the opportunity to, to do that on fire, but after that you need to stop it. because That, that was my, my second, course, the second one that is, I wanted to bring up. This is a good this. way to start to get people in the thinking, but 
we need to stop burning. I'm very exactly, sorry because that. Polis was clearly saying, you know, a bunch yeah. of crazy pyromaniacs, like, stop yeah. with the fire. And you're like, let's bring back fire. Yeah. yeah. Well, because if you look at <laughs> from a, a social perspective, a robust social perspective, what, what can people do themselves? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, burning things, we are very good at this. Yes, so everybody no, understands it. So we need to learn and something. Uh, yeah. Of course, people have to learn something. But but what, what what I found interesting is that once you start burning, people get angry, and then uh, we found out, oh, you know, you should not have. Uh, th that's why, for example, uh, the washing day existed mm -hmm. uh, because if you put out your 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 freshly washed clothes and somebody starts burning um, a fire, yeah, then everything stinks again. So that's that's where something interesting happens that you have yeah. to also start in a communal yeah. way, start yeah. to uh, work together in this. And 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 the second thing is that if you burn your own garbage in front of your own house, then it's your garbage and it's your stink, you know. So but isn't that indeed exactly what we need to stop doing? Burning things into the atmosphere. I don't get. Well, now it's abstract, and yeah, now it happens uh, in the harbor, and you yeah. and the, the they pipes are they high enough. stop to with that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you mean n no yeah. more uh, heated food anymore? No. But on much, solar. Much more ways of getting something more. Yes. Yeah. Very efficient also. Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I think the <laughs> the um, well the fact that you, you are part of um, a system or uh, or not even a system, but like a part of the world, then somehow to repair that 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 is the key thing to also learn, you know, that you are part yeah, of it. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, it's a social intervention, yeah. it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know what? I'm going to bring in our third speaker because I know fire is also um, part of, of, of her thinking, maybe. Let's give a round of applause to Mele before he secretly <laughs> leaves the stage. Uh, and Mele made space for Eva Pfannes. And Eva is an architect and the co-founder of international design practice OOS, or OZ. OOS, yes. Uh, that works internationally on architecture, on understanding ecological processes, deep insights into social cultural behavior, so a whole range of connecting dots. Uh, widely published author, co-curator of the ninth International Architecture Bi Biannual in Rotterdam as well. And she's here, hopefully, to within eight minutes, <laughs> share her insights with us as well. Thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ben, and thank you for the invitation. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to uh, give a third perspective, or maybe actually very similar on, in some ways to both of the previous um, presentations and talks. So we stay in the same neighborhood um, in Bospolder Tissendijken in Rotterdam, um, as Melle already um, showed it. And I'm going to talk about the LEAP, the Local Energy Action Plan that we were commissioned to work on. <laughs> Um, as a research by design project, and we worked on it together also with Jürgen von der Heiden, who is in the audience uh, from, at the time, AT Osborne and Studio Bauhaven. And the question was, how can we use the energy transition, so the immense amounts of money and investment that come with getting off the gas, to actually, uh, for, for something like a social leverage, we could say, to bring up the neighborhood and to have much more benefits and soft qualities that could come with this investment if we do it smartly and in an integrated way. Um, the clear goal is simply um, to be CO2 neutral in 2050. That's what um, countries committed themselves to um, uh, with the Paris Agreement. Now, the question is, is this realistic? Um, can we ever be CO2 neutral, and is it not much too late? Um, when we started working, uh, this, this kind of, we tried to, we, we knew we wanted to go into the neighborhood, and we knew we wanted to, we needed to get more to grips with that notion of CO2, like, um, and why is the energy transition necessary, and that's just a quick summary. Um, Bospolder Tüsendagen is indeed extremely dense, it's as dense as Paris, um, and it uses, in fact, comparatively little energy. But to get more to grips what it actually is, we um, decided to make a research first into the current footprint um, of a Dutch person. 
um, where the energy, so the energy transition that we talk about, is only 18% of that footprint. A quarter is food, a quarter is material, so consumption. A quarter is mobility, 10% is waste, and the rest is um, domestic energy. And so with, with that, we ran some um, workshops. So this was just sort of pre-COVID times to also see what is the interest of, um, of um, in initiatives in Bosporda Tusentaik in, into this question. And we found that there's an extreme hunger for information and to know more and to, for instance, uh, simply also think the um, energy transition is necessary because we have earthquakes um, in Groningen. And so our task was really how to connect the technical part, the systems um, and the, in the different locations with actions and coalitions to get to a commonly owned energy system that has many co-benefits. So <coughs> we developed um, an instrumentarium, uh, we call it a set of instruments that connect and integrate climate mitigation, so that's everything to do with energy, uh, climate adaptation, so that's everything to do with water and plants. Um, so those two things, we create, in fact, a new, uh, a new type of commons, new assets that we can then share and run commonly. And um, for the energy, we have to think of how can we capture, store, transform, use and distribute the energy locally. And how can we then with the climate adaptation tools, so that is uh, tools we, we know it's going to get warmer, so how can we cool um, our neighborhoods, so we find different ways of planting and of collecting rainwater to feed those plants. Um, so the third part, the governance tools, we looked specifically um, next to policies and next to um, movement making tools into organization and financing models and what roles different inhabitants and different people in the community could play and what different financing possibilities would be. And so in the middle of that uh, visualization, you see an ESCO, an energy service company that's run as a cooperative and that could actually take on um, solar panels, but also nature-based solutions, also um, heat cold um, storage, VKOs. Um, and could invest in the next 30 years and run and supply a certain block of a neighborhood with these systems. For Boswald and Tussenaigen, we looked into a, into a methodology where we connected case studies with a study on the whole neighborhood. So we looked into four different cases of different type of architectural and spatial typologies and different type of inhabitants and different type of ownership models. So some VVA, some uh, owned by Hafenstader entirely. Um, so this is one example. I have to run through now a bit more quick because of the time restriction. Um, so this is uh, uh, 550 inhabitants. We um, developed here um, together also with Bron Technologie, um, which is um, um, a company that's uh, busy with uh, WKOs, Warmte Koude Opslag in the Netherlands since a very long time. And we calculated the whole thing through in terms of um, what how do we have to do to make it energy self-sufficient? How far can we get? And how far can we get in greening? So how much water do we actually have in order to achieve a 50% green um, surface? And so what you see here is, um, I can only scratch the surface, we, could, we found that we can have 100% electrification, we can... So we can generate 100% of the heat we need with aqua thermal and with the warmte uh, koude opslag. We can um, reduce the energy question by insulation by 55%, and we can have 20% of local energy production for this specific case. That would cost altogether 10, a bit more than 10 million euros. And with that question, we went actually to the Bank Nederlandse Gemeenschap. And we found that as a cooperative model, the Bank Nederlandse Gemeenschap would um, finance this over 30 years. Um, and we could keep the same or even a little bit less um, energy costs um, as people have now with a locally relocalized energy system uh, that is not dependent on petro dictatorships and that is not outsourcing the profits to Japan. 
And so then we ran the same thing for the green spaces. Um, how much water would we actually able um, to store? How much water could we sort of keep in the ground? Um, then we looked also into how would that look? How could we actually celebrate infrastructure? How would, could we create spaces uh, that are shared and that are visible and that become part of our living environment rather than hiding everything under the ground, which happened, let's say, 100, 150 years ago. We hid all the water systems, all the energy systems away, and it's sort of this out of sight, out of mind. Uh, we, we, we don't have any relationship anymore to the infrastructure that is vital and that we need to survive. And so that is kind of the idea of this whole plan. How can we bring that on, onto our, in our daily life, that we can actually discuss it. And we're not saying this is the solution. This is actually just uh, some scenarios that we made in order to discuss uh, potential options. And by realizing those case studies, there would certainly be mistakes, but then we could discuss it. And so that is kind of what we think is needed to make that step forward. And so this um, cost-benefit analysis here shows um, the sort of connection between the resources that planet Earth gives us for free and that we kind of need to build certain devices in order to make, make use of those um, resources that we get for free. And that gives us um, a quantitative benefit. So that's uh, what I explained already on the scale of the neighborhood, how much that um, would be. And uh, qualitative benefits that would contribute to reaching the so sustainable development goals that we all agreed on. And then we looked into the urgency and how we could combine social energy and natural systems in order to reach, we, we looked at ownerships. That's another um, important question. Who is owning what we have in the ground? And how can we actually start up discussions around what everybody wants and wh what maybe different wishes are and therefore identify roadblocks on the way to upscale from a simple exhibition where we share this knowledge to uh, implementing it in different neighborhoods. In, in, the, in the Netherlands. And so that was the exhibition at the time where all those um, res research was arranged as an agora in order to stimulate a discussion that unfortunately never took place physically. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so these are just some impressions from this exhibition. Um, at the time, we also showed, we also thought it is important in this Agora to show what the municipality is busy with, what are the plans, how, 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 because that is something like a bit of a black box uh, for many people, and what is the energy that's in the neighborhood that Meli so beautifully explained, what are people busy with, what's the social capacity that we could uh, tap into. And then for the second round of the exhibition, we the, this kind of um, these instruments. We try to make them more tangible, um, so that people could actually imagine the roles. And we try to put a lot of energy into the communication. And just to round off, um, just in terms of financing, it is very interesting to think how what are the yeah mekopel concern, what what are the potentials to link and to integrate um, energy. Uh, green, blue, and the social. And we see, now it's a little bit mixed up, there's one missing. We see actually that in um, uh, energy, we have around 4 billion investment per year. That was in 2020. Um, climate adaptation is around 2 billion. But for instance, um, health, now that's really huge because suddenly that's 200 billion. And that's where we actually lose if we don't do anything. Um, then later on, we have to pay a lot in that domain. So the question is, can we leverage some of that investment into making a better environment today? And um, so how, like, basically that research, research tries to look into how can the neighborhood level inform how we can get to reaching the Paris Agreement with all the different policy tools that we have in between in the Netherlands. Please join us, Eva, for the last uh, few minutes of 
discussion, and I would love to pick that up um, where we where you left off actually in your presentation. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that you're both like kind of hyper local, like uh, on the same neighborhood in Rotterdam. Really interesting to mm -hmm. see that from different perspectives. But you also ended with the uh, the global, the international, and I think the Solar Biennale is also around, you know, seeing the bigger picture in that sense. And I was just curious to, to hear from you, you know, if if we think about because I know you also work in places like Brazil and in mm -hmm. India and around where we have a very different context when it mm -hmm. comes indeed to ownership of, mm -hmm. of the technology, the resources mm -hmm. and um, the access mm -hmm. to what we are talking about. Um, how can we think about, you know, along with this, uh, this intent of ours to build a, a, a future that's also way more decolonial, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can we think mm -hmm. about this solar future? I think the colonial thing is that we create this sort of victim perpetrator situation and we see people in, in poor neighborhoods as victims. And what we found, and that is across India, Brazil, uh, Netherlands, it's everywhere the same, is nobody wants to be a victim. And everybody, no matter how poor, they want to <coughs> work on their future and they want to play an active role in shaping their future. And, and I think that is, that is where we have to basically start. We have to uh, not take anybody for stupid because people are not. And we have to, uh, we found always um, a real curiosity and um, a real gratitude for actually being present or being involved in solutions and uh, gratitude for doing it with a beauty. Uh, in it, and with, with the cultural aspect in it, that, that is, uh, people feel valued immediately when you um, take care of certain things and you don't just throw something into the letterbox, which people <laughs> might not be able to read. And um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's the, and I think there really the cultural sector has, has to play a much bigger um, role into. Um, mm. connecting where people are to where we have to be as a society. That's interesting to me that indeed, um, you know, in a situation where people are given more access and influence maybe, and what you say, they mm. display gratitude mm -hmm. for that, that's of course not always the case. There is, there is a reality of exploitation and, you know, of, of the opposite of solidarity, let's mm -hmm. say, in, in who gets what, mm -hmm. also in terms of energy and and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the access to, to mm -hmm. like a more beautiful future that we speak mm -hmm. about so how well that energy that we don't have access to I mean right now that's as uh, kind of blatantly obvious as it can be mm -hmm. um, that we dependent on energy sources in Russia that are connected to political systems that yeah. we don't support and that we are subject to and and um, and then we say, yeah, what shall we do now? And um, so basically that is when you relocalize it and when you make, um, um, you, you spoke about it also, when, when you make it um, smaller, let's say, the, the sort of you, you shrink the transport costs immensely mm -hmm. and you make the ownership much more uh, clear. Um, we, we, we've done a few projects where we realized water systems, um, also one energy project, and we found that when you actually make it physical, then you start to think, oh yeah, shit, I, I can only water a garden which is half the size um, than I thought I could with right. the water I can yeah. collect. So I so better, also really you know, bringing adapt. Kind of democratizing knowledge. Of yeah, what, it yeah. is. It is kind of learning and democratizing knowledge and yeah. and 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 sharing the insights, the enlightenment that comes with it. Um, it is very important and to get a, a feeling again for, yeah, how big is the solar panel yeah. I need to load my smartphone with every day or basically exactly. to, to get to, to this feeling of currency and numbers like we need to, we, yeah. need, we need to get it. To work we, with yeah, them. have that knowledge. As we round off this first hour and engage in conversation with all of you, 
Paulus, any last thought or any last response to, um, to Eva's? Is any of the cases already uh, decided and we, with the participation of the <laughs> citizens involved? We have one case, the first case I mm -hmm. showed, where we have a, good, uh, a group of uh, VVAs and a mm -hmm. very good um, um, kind of, uh, with Pri together with Delfthaven uh, yeah. Cooperati and where Hafenstader owns only half of the building. So there, ah, there yeah. we're starting yeah. to get into talks now. Yeah. Um, for instance, the second case with the with the um, uh, Heising flats, that's a lot like lost uh, yeah. case or but but the, that's uh, about in struck it, me uh, about how you uh, approach the cases <coughs> is that you integrate everything. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> I'm, I'm doing projects like these, but I, I started with a different approach. Mm -hmm. uh, start small with a heating solution, mm -hmm. with ownership of the mm -hmm. neighborhood, and tackle the issues that come with it. Mm -hmm. And after that, you have some kind of social mm -hmm. structure mm -hmm. that can decide next things. Mm -hmm. And all these next things are mm -hmm. on your slides. So this yeah, is, yeah. you, you mm -hmm. do everything at once. Mm -hmm. And I thought, let's start with the easy part and then mm -hmm. grow in growing the community. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually we did it uh, the the same way. Um, we we just thought when we connect green, so also cooling with yeah. heating, it's a sort of kind of no brainer. But also with the greening, we have some very light actions that don't demand much investment, where yeah. we can no, which we course, can use yeah. to do this community building process. Yeah, build the green nice public space is, comes yeah. just first. They, yeah. You don't have to yeah. Yeah. You don't put it on the agenda. Yeah. It comes mm -hmm. by itself. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. now, the the way I was, uh, I was approaching that, like, yeah. um, it's a neighborhood thing. So it's small and mm -hmm. it needs a lot of attention in the start because mm -hmm. you're changing this system approach mm -hmm. to a more uh, a Lebensfeld approach. Yeah. Um, but it needs to be able to copy it a thousand times. And mm -hmm. this is, so this is why I'm looking for easy solutions that mm -hmm. can be copied easily mm -hmm. so that we can all use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. ladies. <laughs> I'm going to stop this discussion oh, no, here one, for one now. One question. Is there still a burning oven over there? Uh, a burning it, what? A burning oven for bread and so, or for waste in Bospol de Tussendorp. Is it still there? Is it still burning? Which one? Uh, yeah. The oven, um, uh -huh. the small one? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's actually, uh, <laughs> it, it's indeed, it, it's growing by itself. So. Yeah, and I couldn't match the two projects, but is it the same, it's the same neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Both two. <laughs> 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 All right, we're not done here, but we do want to round off this part also for people watching uh, uh, this first hour. We have gone through several kind of interpretations of what solar means in this aspect. I found it really interesting how uh, Paula started also with, you know, how we talk is how we think, is how we talk is how we think, how we create our own reality through social relations um, as a social element in this discussion. We also spoke about, you know, the, the collective, and Mela brought up these social uh, spaces, the public, public spaces that we need to actively create to be able to include everybody who is not normally included. Um, and also what, what both of you kind of brought in is this, you know, the, the, so the, the human energy that's also kind of freed up in, in social relationships. And, and if you do it together, like what type of human power can actually come out? Uh, and, and what you brought in, the, the social and the natural, uh, how these realms actually need to be tackled hand in hand. Um, so I feel, you know, the, the commons, the co-ops, the, the ways of organizing was another aspect. So I think there's a lot of different conversations to be had, actually, when we speak about the social aspect. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us, of course. Uh, you can check out the agenda. This was number two in a series of four programs around the Solar Biennale, but of course there's a lot more happening at Podcasts as always. Uh, I also want to encourage you uh, to become a Podcasts member if you value these programs. Uh, you're very welcome to become a member. For You can scan the QR code that you'll see uh, in a second. You pay 15 euros a year and you you know, make it possible to have these important conversations and to keep having uh, them forever. Um, so thank you to our speakers 
for now. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. And we'll continue the discussion in a sec.